This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Letters of Two Brides by Honoré de Balzac. Letter 4. The Same to the Same. December 15th. Yesterday, at two o'clock, I went to drive in the Champs-Élysées and the Bois de Boulogne. It was one of those autumn days which we used to find so beautiful on the banks of the Loire. So I have seen Paris at last. The Place Louis the Fifteenth is certainly very fine, but the beauty is that of man's handiwork. I was dressed to perfection, pensive, with set face, though inwardly much tempted to laugh, under a lovely hat, my arms crossed. Would you believe it? Not a single smile was thrown at me. Not one poor youth was struck motionless as I passed. Not a soul turned to look again. And yet the carriage proceeded with a deliberation worthy of my pose. No, I am wrong. There was one, a duke and a charming man, who suddenly reined in as we went by. The individual who thus saved appearances for me was my father, and he proclaimed himself highly gratified by what he saw. I met my mother also, who sent me a butterfly kiss from the tips of her fingers. The worthy Griffith, who fears no man, cast her glances hither and thither without discrimination. In my judgment, a young woman should always know exactly what her eye is resting on. I was mad with rage. One man actually inspected my carriage without noticing me. This flattering homage probably came from a carriage-maker. I have been quite out in the reckoning of my forces. Plainly, beauty, that rare gift which comes from heaven, is commoner in Paris than I thought. I saw hats doffed with deference to simpering fools. A purple face called forth murmurs of, "'It is she!' My mother received an immense amount of admiration." There is an answer to this problem, and I mean to find it. The men, my dear, seemed to me generally very ugly. The very few exceptions are bad copies of us. Heaven knows what evil genius has inspired their costume. It is amazingly inelegant compared with those of former generations. It has no distinction, no beauty of colour or romance. It appeals neither to the senses, nor the mind, nor the eye and it must be very uncomfortable. It is meagre and stunted. The hat, above all, struck me. It is a sort of truncated column, and does not adapt itself in the least to the shape of the head. But I am told it is easier to bring about a revolution than to invent a graceful hat. Courage in Paris recoils before the thought of appearing in a round felt, and for lack of one day's daring men stick all their lives to this ridiculous headpiece. And yet Frenchmen are said to be fickle. The men are hideous anyway, whatever they put on their heads. I have seen nothing but worn, hard faces, with no calm nor peace in the expression. The harsh lines and furrows speak of foiled ambition and smarting vanity. A fine forehead is rarely seen. "'And these are the product of Paris?' I said to Miss Griffith. "'Most cultivated and pleasant men,' she replied. "'I was silent. "'The heart of a spinster of thirty-six is a well of tolerance. "'In the evening I went to the ball, "'where I kept close to my mother's side. "'She gave me her arm, with a devotion which did not miss its reward. "'All the honours were for her. "'I was made the pretext for charming compliments. "'She was clever enough to find me fools for my partners,' who one and all expatiated on the heat and the beauty of the ball, till you might suppose I was freezing and blind. Not one failed to enlarge on the strange, unheard-of, extraordinary, odd, remarkable fact that he saw me for the first time. My dress, which dazzled me as I paraded alone in my white and gold drawing-room, was barely noticeable amidst the gorgeous finery of most of the married women. Each had her band of faithful followers, and they all watched each other askance. A few were radiant in triumphant beauty, and amongst these was my mother. 
A girl at a ball is a mere dancing machine, a thing of no consequence whatever. The men, with rare exceptions, did not impress me more favorably here than at the Champs Elysees. They have a used up look, their features are meaningless, or rather, they have all the same meaning. The proud, stalwart bearing which we find in the portraits of our ancestors, men who joined moral to physical vigor, has disappeared. Yet in this gathering there was one man of remarkable ability, who stood out from the rest by the beauty of his face. But even he did not rouse in me the feeling which I should have expected. I do not know his works, and he is a man of no family. Whatever the genius and the merits of a plebeian or a commoner, he could never stir my blood. Besides, this man was obviously so much more taken up with himself than with anybody else, that I could not but think these great brain-workers must look on us as things, rather than persons. When men of intellectual power love, they ought to give up writing, otherwise their love is not the real thing. The lady of their heart does not come first in all their thoughts. I seemed to read all this in the bearing of the man I speak of. I am told he is a professor, orator, and author, whose ambition makes him the slave of every bigwig. My mind was made up on the spot. It was unworthy of me, I determined, to quarrel with society for not being impressed by my merits, and I gave myself up to the simple pleasure of dancing, which I thoroughly enjoyed. I heard a great deal of inept gossip about people of whom I know nothing, but perhaps it is my ignorance on many subjects which prevents me from appreciating it, as I saw that most men and women took a lively pleasure in certain remarks, whether falling from their own lips or those of others. Society bristles with enigmas which look hard to solve. It is a perfect maze of intrigue, yet I am fairly quick of sight and hearing, and as to my wits, Mademoiselle de Malcolm does not need to be told. I returned home, tired, with a pleasant sort of tiredness, and in all innocence began describing my sensations to my mother, who was with me. She checked me with the warning that I must never say such things to any one but her. "'My dear child,' she added, "'it needs as much tact to know when to be silent as when to speak.' This advice brought home to me the nature of the sensations which ought to be concealed from every one, not excepting, perhaps, even a mother. At a glance I measured the vast field of feminine duplicity. I can assure you, sweetheart, that we, in our unabashed simplicity, would pass for two very wide-awake little scandal-mongers. What lessons may be conveyed in a finger on the lips, in a word, a look, all in a moment I was seized with excessive shyness. What? May I never again speak of the natural pleasure I feel in the exercise of dancing? How, then, I said to myself, about the deeper feelings? I went to bed sorrowful, and I still suffer from the shock produced by this first collision of my frank, joyous nature with the harsh laws of society. Already the highway hedges are flecked with my white wool— Farewell, beloved. End of letter four. Read by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. On November 2nd, 2006, in Oceanside, California.